Hello, everybody. I used to say good evening, but now, but now I know I've learned. Um, I have glasses on tonight, so some of you are like, you've, you've never worn glasses, not new glasses. Um, this eye is a little bit sore, so if it's a little bit red, don't um, worry. It's my problem, not yours. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Today I'm doing a message called Surviving, Striving and Thriving. Surviving, Striving, or let me say Surviving, Striving or Thriving. Because it's not like you're going to do all three. It's kind of like we want you to do, we want you to do one. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to uh, share this video, like, comment, subscribe. Helps with our algorithm. It helps to take us forward. And thank you so much for everybody that's contributing to our ministry. You are helping us go forward. And may God bless you big time. So, 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you have a Bible, go to 1 Samuel, cha Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel 16, I'm going to read quite a lot, verse 1 to 13, because I have to get to the, to the core of the story. And I'm going to speak to you guys about surviving, striving, and thriving. Um, I want to encourage you to, you know, when you listen to this message, just bring a notebook, bring a pen, write things like surviving, striving, thriving, know the difference between the three, know that the, thir the first two isn't good, and that the third one um, is the one that we're going to focus on, and the one that we want to live in. 1 Samuel 16 verse 1 to 30. Now this is the story where King David was anointed as king. It's not the story where he became king. It is merely the story where he was anointed as king. Uh, so let's look at how this, how this story happened. Now the Lord said to Samuel, now Samuel at that time was the prophet, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among the sons. So here God comes and he says, okay, Saul's time is done. We want a different king. Go to Jesse's house. There I'm going to anoint a king for you. Now, what's very interesting here is God didn't tell Samuel who the king is going to be. They didn't say, listen, the guy has eight sons. The eighth son in the shepherd's field, his name is David. He's going to be king. He just said to him, go. What's very important for us to know here is sometimes God tells you to go. Sometimes God tells you to do something without giving you the details. So many times we want all the details before we obey. By the way, this is why, this is why Saul wasn't king anymore. Saul, God removed Saul for being king because, because he told Saul, kill all of the animals. Saul killed some of the animals and kept the good ones for himself. And God came to a place where he said, Saul, I cannot trust you. I need a king that I can trust. Saul was maybe a good fighter. Saul was maybe a handsome guy. Saul was maybe clever. Saul was maybe a good leader, but God couldn't trust this guy. He was like, he, he literally said, but Saul said to God, but I've made sacrifices to the Lord. God said, but obedience is better than sacrifice. I want you guys to write this down. Wherever you're watching from, I don't think it was necessary to say that, but I did. <laughs> Obedience is better than sacrifice. Always do what God tells you to do. Because for Samuel, maybe this didn't make sense. Just to say, listen, go down to Jesse's house. Because if I was Samuel, I'm a detailed person. I love detail. Abram, the same thing. God said to Abram, leave your house. Where am I going? I'm not going to tell you. Just leave. I'll tell you on the way. He, 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 he stayed at a place called Ur. I also would have left if I stayed at a place called Ur. <laughs> but he went, he went on God's instruction. And God didn't tell him where to go. I don't know why I'm going to Abram now, but God didn't tell Abram where to go. He just told him to go. Abram took Lot with him. Now, this is a very, very, very interesting fact. God didn't tell Abram where to go until Lot separated from him. This is very interesting. Abram took Lot with him, something that he shouldn't have done. And only when he separated from Lot, God spoke to him again. Because God lives in your obedience. God is always with you. He always loves you. He'll always be good to you. But it's your obedience that will get you where God wants you to be. And this is something Saul obviously didn't do. Verse 3. Oh, I cannot believe I'm so far. I'm only in verse 3. 
then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. So I'm not going to tell you now. The only thing I'm going to tell you is to go. The only thing I'm going to tell you is to do. The only thing I'm going to tell you is to obey. And then after that, I will do what I need to do. Verse 4, so Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, did you come peaceably? And he said, and he said, peaceably, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourself. Sanctify yourself means to separate yourself. Something that's very important to spend time with God is to separate yourself. Separate yourself from your busy life. Separate yourself from your thoughts of the past and the future. Get into the here and the now. Spend time with God in a sacrificed state or a sanctified. Sorry, that's the right word. Sanctified. Separate state. And come to me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse. Consecrated is the same thing. It's like the same thing as sanctifies, just to get separated. Consecrate Jesse and his sons and invite them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So here Jesse comes and oh, here, here Samuel comes and he says to this family, Okay, bring all your sons. They bring seven sons. And he says, Okay, the Lord has anointed a king. So here Jesse comes. Jesse takes Eliab because Eliab, according to Jesse, is the best son, probably because he was the oldest son. Maybe he was the biggest and the strongest and the smartest. So Jesse comes and he's like, I'm sure the Lord wants to anoint Eliab. Here we go. Let's send Eliab. And Samuel is like, no, the oil didn't flow. Because the oil is going to flow for the one that God wants to anoint as king. So he brings Eliab. And said, surely the, anoint, the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance. 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 <laughs> do not look at his appearance. Or at his, like, I, cannot, I don't like sentences like this. I like it when people look at appearances. But anyway, <laughs> do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. Because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For a man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab, like that's a nice name. Mm -hmm. If you are pregnant and you're still in need for a name for your son and it's a boy, um, I literally have to read the name again, Abinadab. <laughs> there you go. And made him pass before Samuel and said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah. Can you believe Shammah? He brought Shammah. <laughs> passed by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, uh, the Lord has not chosen these. Verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? He said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send him and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes. So he sent and brought him in. He was ruddy, with bright eyes, good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Ramah, Ramah, Ramah. It's probably not a butter, but anyway. <laughs> have you guys ever have you guys ever heard of the placebo effect? Anybody ever heard about the placebo? If you ever if you heard about the placebo effect, uh, put it in the comments. It helps with my algorithm. Um, so the placebo effect is when somebody gives you an astro if you don't know what an astro is like get astros it's the best chocolates ever if you like me buy me astros i love astros if it was like a smarty smarties aren't as nice as astros but anyway if somebody gives you a smart you're an astro and they say this is medication and this is medication that's going to cure your disease and you and you and you eat that um thing that looks like a pill and you believe it's a pill and you believe this thing is going to cure you and you actually get cured it's not the it's not the medication that cure you it's literally that the belief or the faith that you put in it that's going to cure you and i've i've read a scientific study recently that said 50 percent of the medication we use heals us because of the placebo effect because we believe it's going to heal us 
And then you get something that they call the nocebo effect. I actually only heard of it this week. The nocebo effect is where stressful and toxic thinking can make you sick. Stressful and toxic thinking can make you sick. What is stress? Stress is emotional or mental strain, mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. So mentally and emotionally, I'm at, I'm at a very bad place because of external, external circumstances. Now, st uh, stress, living in stress is what we call living in survival mode. Now, did you know that stress, who of you believe stress is a bad thing? Lift up your hand if you believe stress is a bad thing. Um, put it in the comment if you believe stress is a bad thing. Lift up your hands if you believe stress is a good thing. Okay. Lift up your hands if you're not going to lift up your hand no matter what I ask. <laughs> to both. Yeah. Stress initially is not a bad thing. Initially, the, the initial reason stress was given or stress is given to us, um, you know, and I, I believe to, to say, you know, some stress is actually given by God, I believe is, is true. I'm not sp speaking about an ungodly stress or an, or an ungodly worry. This is what I mean by some stress is actually good. If you walk in your backyard and you encounter a bear and you have no weapons with you and you have no stress, you're not going to make it okay if you're walking on a high building and you and you're about to walk off the building and you don't care you don't have any worry about this it's probably not going to end well stress is that thing in us that helps us to survive that's that's why it's there it, it helps us to survive if you never stress I, I'm speaking about a healthy stress if you never stress you're not going to survive if you drive in your car and you see a red traffic light and you don't stress about it, <laughs> if you swim in the ocean and you see a jellyfish coming, <laughs> then you're great. Like if you see a jellyfish coming, then brilliant. Like you have very good sight. <laughs> like why did you use that example? Like, I don't know. Okay. So how does stress affect us? Stress normally happens when we cannot predict the outcome. When you cannot predict the outcome, stress helps you kind of like to get out of the situation because I, I, this, there's not literally a snake here. I'm just using an example. I cannot predict what the snake is going to do, so I'll rather get out of the way. Sometimes we stress in life because we cannot predict the outcome. Now, imagine this. If I say there's a lion in the backyard and you're not stressed about the lion whatsoever, you're probably going to go out in the backyard. If you go out in the backyard and you see the lion, that stress causes you to survive. But now what happens now is stress is not caused by a lion. Stress is caused by a coworker. The coworker is the lion. And it feels like I cannot escape this thing. Stress is not caused by a lion in my backyard or a snake in my house. Stress is now caused by bills that I have to pay. And now what happens is the stress is within and now you feel like you cannot escape. So what happens? You live in survival mode the whole time. Your whole life is as if there's this lion in my backyard or the snake in my house that I have to survive from. Do you guys get what I'm saying? And that is what we call survival mode. You stressed the whole time. And you and you and you're now in survival mode. You're not you're not at a place where I want to thrive in life, where I want to do better in life. I just want to survive. I don't get along with my coworkers. I don't get along with my boss. These people are like the lion in my backyard or the snake in my house. And every single day, I'm just surviving. My own family can some not mine. I'm just using as an example. Can sometimes feel like that that cause of stress, and it and it feels like I have to survive the whole time. My, 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 my job, my life. It feels like there's something within me that I have to survive from the whole time. That's how you live in survival mode because you feel like you cannot predict the outcome. Because I cannot predict the outcome, I just have to survive. Then again, we stress because we feel we cannot control the situation. I'm, I, I don't feel like I'm in control. And if I don't feel like I'm in control, the best thing I can do is I can just try to survive. 
then the other way of stress affects us is where there's a threat or perception that things are getting worse. My, my whole belief system is saying to me, everything within me is telling me, you know, every, things are about to get worse. Then we get things that is not always in our control. That's our outer world. Outer world is not always in your control. Then you get something that's in your control and that's your inner world. What's your inner world? Your inner world is your own thoughts, your, your own imagination, your own beliefs and your own choices. That's your inner world. Mm -hmm. Cannot always control your outer world, but you can to a very big extent control your, in, your, your inner world. But now what if stress is caused by your inner world and not your outer, and not your outer world? If stress is now caused by your own thoughts, your own imagination, your own belief system, your own prediction about the future or whatever, then it means the thing that's stressing you out is not in your outer world anymore. It's literally something within you. So now you live in survival against your own thoughts, against your own beliefs, against your own imagination and against your own predictions. And that is when the non SIBO effect starts to work. Your own thoughts, your own imagination, your own belief system is now busy making you sick. Is now busy making you, 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 you basically live in a survival mode within yourself. Now, we get three types of stress or three things that makes us stress. Number one is physical stress. Physical stress is on your physical body when, you, when you're in an accident, when you fall off something and you break a leg, when you, get, when you get physically injured. That's a physical stress. And then you get a chemical stress. Chemical stress is normally when you get sick from a bacteria or a virus or something like that. That is, that is your chemical stress. And then you get your emotional stress. Your emotional stress is when there's family trauma, financial worries, it causes you to have, a, to, have an, to have an emotional stress. And again, what I said earlier is stress is for what? Stress is for protection. I feel like I now have to get protected from something. Now, again, like I said earlier, now if the problem is within, if the problem is within me, the thing that I'm surviving from is not something in the outer world, but the thing that I'm trying to survive from is now in my inner world. Now, it's very important to note that the outer world can, can, can have a big influence on this. The outer world can have a big influence on what is going on in my inner world. But I have, to a very big extent, influence on my inner world. Now, three thi or four things, there are four things we can do when we're in the stress mode if we want to protect ourselves. And it's kind of like reactions that we have. And the first reaction that we can have is fight. Everybody say fight. fight. Okay, three people say fight. Let's see what, let's see what happened to, to, the, to the other. So the first one is fight. That is where you are in anger or an aggression. Who of you can honestly say, I've, I, I, I've had a fight with the thing that stresses me out? Okay. Those of you who say yes, that's normally a person, right? It's probably not a bear <laughs> or a lion or something. And I'm not meaning like a physical fight. You know, it can be a verbal fight. It can, it can even be a mental fight. I had a fight with the thing. Okay, let's ask again. Whoever had a fight with the thing that caused them to, to go into stress? Okay, so that's one of the reactions we can have. They call it, they call it the fight reaction. That's one of the four. The, the, the other one we can have is what, is what they call the flight reaction. The flight reaction is anxiety and avoidance. I get anxious about the situation, so I avoid it. I kind of run away. I hide away from this thing. Avoidance. And like I said, this can be a good thing. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Is, um, is, if, is if I feel like I have to run away from something or avoid something to protect myself, if I have to fight something to protect myself, not necessarily a bad thing, but now I'm asking you again, what if the thing that causes the stress, what if the thing that causes these responses lives within you? Because believe it or not, uh, I think they say 70% of people, the stress response lives within them. They say they did a survey on people. I think this was actually a very interesting, if I can say this survey for the person who did it. They spoke to people who were basically on their deathbeds. And they interviewed them and they said, what do you regret? And they say 90% of people said, I really wish I worried less. I stressed less because they, they realized that the thing that, that stresses these people out was something within them. 
the survival is within me. Then the third thing you can do is what they call freeze. You get stuck or immobilized. It's like you feel like you cannot move anymore. Um, I don't think this is a good thing if a bear attacks you and you just freezes, right? They say it's good with a shark. Like I, I, like I really, I wanted to go, I wanted to do great white diving once. Um, and I couldn't because they said before you can dive sharks, you have to dive these little fishes. And like, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's either sharks or nothing. <laughs> but, but then they say, if a shark attacks, you just be very quiet and very still and they'll leave you alone. I guess that's, that's where freeze does very well. But, um, <laughs> but freezes at that place where you're so stressed, where you feel like you cannot get out of the bed, you cannot feel like you get, can get out of the chair, it feels like you cannot go on with life. You are freezed or you are immobilized. That's one of the things. And the fourth thing is fawn. Fawn is people pleasing or avoiding conflict. It's like things are not going well maybe with other people and things and people are stressing you out and immediately where you want to please them you want to um, i don't know what's the nice word to describe it they get the afrikaans word but i don't know what the nice Indi english english word is um appease. appease i don't know what that means appease <laughs> let's hope that's the right word um <laughs> but any, but anyway, it's kind of like you go into this thing and like you want to please people, you want to you want to do for people what they don't want to do for themselves. You want to be nice to people even to your own detriment because you want to avoid conflict. Um, it's 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 basically it's basically where, to where you get to that place where you hurt yourself to please other people because you just don't want people to be angry with you. People like this, they will go in a stress mode, and what they will do is they will ask everybody, "Are you angry with me? Is everything okay? Why didn't you? Why didn't you reply me? Why didn't you talk to me? Why didn't you? Why didn't you? Why didn't you smile at me today? I think this one is angry with me that didn't greet me this morning." So people people who are informed will will basically react like this so this is the four reactions you can get when you're in stress mode you know some of some people are fighters some people run away some people just f freeze and some people will form this is this is what stress does in the survival mode so survival are people who live in a constant state of stress and they live in a constant state of survival every single day i just have to survive if i can survive this month this this month i'll be happy if i can survive in my job survive with my bills survive in my family i've survived and i feel okay i'm in this mode all i want to do is i want to survive and i don't want to want to thrive anymore so to live in survival mode, I, I, I guess you guys can see by now that this is not a good thing. This is not, this is not where we want to be. We want to use stress for what, is in, what it is intended for. We want to use it to protect ourselves. But the body is also like that, that when you feel attacked by something and the stress mode kicks in, as soon as that thing is gone, the thing that would have attacked you is gone, your body has the natural ability to reinstate itself to the normal state but this is where it gets difficult if the thing that causes stress is within you if it's with, within your own mind if it's within your own belief system if it's within your own imagination that is where it becomes that is where it becomes bad so because of the size of the neocortex do you guys know what the neocortex is you do okay great so i don't have to explain it <laughs> no i'm just kidding so in your, in your brain, you get what they call the limbic system. The limbic system is what they call your emotional brain. And then you get the neocortex, what they, what, what we just called your thinking brain. Now, the neocortex is the, is the bigger part. Okay? The neocortex is big. That's your thinking brain. That's your logical brain. Now, because your neocortex is so big, your thinking has a massive influence on your feeling, on your emotional state, and your stressful state right this is why your thinking plays an amazing amazing role you can think yourself into survival mode you can think yourself into this mode of you know i just want to cope and i just want to survive and i just want to i just want to get by now my question is do you think that's where god wants us to live in survival mode so here's my question and i want to make this personal that's why i'm looking right into the camera how much of your survival mode is caused by your own thinking, by your own imagination? And you can say, you know, something actually happened to me in life, boy. So you just cannot say that. Yes, I understand. But 
are you using things that happened with you in your life just to confirm your addiction? Because stress can be an addiction. I don't know if you guys knew that. Just like drugs, just like sugar, stress can be an addiction. Because when you stress, listen, when you stress, there's like, there's like this massive amount of energy that gets released in your body to protect yourself. And you get, you, people get addicted to that rush of energy in their body. So every single morning when they wake up, they are looking for the thing that's going to cause that rush of energy. They are looking for the co-worker that upsets them. They are looking for the pain in their body. They are looking for the thing that's causing. That's the first thing they do because they got kind of like addicted to these hormones of stress. Because it causes a rush in the body. And you want to feel that rush in the body. And that's what survival mode, mode does. And because the neocortex is so big, people can, people can turn the stress respo response on. Listen by thought alone. They can turn the stress, the survival mode on by thought alone. Then we get striving. Striving is also not a good thing. Striving is caused by fear. Striving is that place where you, you want to force things. You want to kick doors down. You just, you want the title and you want the promotion and you want the girl or you want the guy because you don't want to be single anymore and you want your title and you want to prove that you are better than this one and you want to prove that you can go far further in life. So you are, you are birthing things before it's time. What if I told you, if anybody thinks they are behind, you know, I think I should have been further by now. I think I should have been promoted by now. I think I should have been richer by now. I think I should have been married by now. What if I told you maybe you are exactly where God wants you to be? I'm not saying necessarily everybody. I'm not saying like this is the Lord says this. I'm saying, but what if? What if you are striving? What if you are trying to kick down doors? What if you are trying to force things? And the Lord is saying, but you're actually right where I want you to be. Because here's the interesting thing about David's story. And we live in, uh, I live in South Africa. And I don't know about other countries, but I think this might be the same. In South Africa, when you get anointed to be king, and your dad tells you, go take care of the sheep, you will rebel against your dad. That's normally how it will work. You're like, how dare you? I've just been anointed as king. <laughs> The man of God has come and he heard from God to anoint me as king. How dare you? So Samuel goes back to Ramah. Jesse tells David, okay, Moy, you're anointed now. Wipe off the oil and go take care of the sheep <laughs> again. And he did it. He went back to being a shepherd. You know what a striving person would have done? Like the hell I won't. No, I'm going to the palace. They came to fetch me. And by the way, Dad, you didn't even think I was important enough to be invited to the ceremony. Not only didn't you think I won't be anointed, you didn't even invite me to see how my brother gets anointed. That's how little, that's how little Jesse thought of David. Like he didn't even invite him. Bring all your sons. I'm going to anoint one. Bring those seven. They will never choose that one. That's how little Jesse thought of David. They anointed David. Jesse tells David, go back, go take, go take care of the sheep again. He's like, okay. That's trusting, not striving. So, so David went back and he took care of the sheep. Now, the most boring job you could have at that time was taking care of sheep. Because you do it for hours and the sheep are just there doing nothing the whole, like many people, but <laughs> no, I'm just, that's just a joke. So the sheep, <laughs> so the sheep is just, are, there, are just there doing nothing. And he has to sit there, look at these sheep doing nothing. Right, they sit there, eat grass. Is it lacquer? Bloody lacquer, yeah. <laughs> and if the grass is finished, they just have to go to a different place. And then this is the picture in my head. David gets bored. And he starts taking slings and rocks and he starts throwing this rock at things. And they said, they said David got so skilled in that sling and that rock that the, that the sling went around eight times per second. 
And I think it was a few hundred meters that he could hit like a very, a, a, a very small thing with, with, with that rock. So what happens, a bear came and David was like, okay, I have to protect myself against this bear. I cannot do nothing because the stress response says I have to take care of myself. So he started to fight. And he said, okay, but I'm not going to be overly stressed. I'm going to handle the situation because I was trained for this. So he took, he took the rock, killed the bear, protected the sheep. And later a lion came and he was like, okay, I've killed a bear before with the sling and the rock. I can kill the lion. I have to protect myself. Went into fight response again. Killed the lion. Then his dad came and he said to him, okay, David, your brothers are fighting. They are warriors. They are soldiers. You are a dumb shepherd. Go back because that's, that's how Jesse thought of David. You're a shepherd. Take, take food for your brothers. He's like, okay, dad, a person in striving would have said, listen, I've been anointed as king of Israel. How dare you ask me to take bread to anybody else? He was like, okay, because he wasn't in striving. He knew if God promised something, it will happen. So he went and he took food to his brothers. While he got there, everybody was in hiding because this big Philistine called Goliath was standing there who was, I, um, and I believe he was from the descendants of Nephilim, right? He was, you don't know? Okay. I think he was from the descendants of Nephilim um, or Anak, I don't know, somewhere there. And he was, he, he, he saw this giant and this is the statement that David made. He's like, I killed the lion. I killed the bear. I can kill this Philistine. Anak. Okay. So, David killed Goliath. But David didn't kill Goliath with, with a sling and a rock. He knocked him down with a sling and a rock. He cut off his head. After he cut off his head, he took his head back to, to Jerusalem and he buried the head in Jerusalem and they call it and they call it the place of the skull. That was the first name. That sounds so cool. The place of the skull, which later became um, the hill of Goliath and later became Golgotha, where Jesus Christ got crucified. Now, imagine David wasn't striving. And he said, I won't take care of the sheep anymore. I'm anointed as king. He would have never been trained to be so good with a sling and a stone. And he would have never killed Goliath. Because he wouldn't have been trained. Because here's what happened. Before he fought Goliath, what happened is Saul started to put armor on him. Saul actually took his armor and he started to put it on David. And you know what David said? David said, I cannot wear this. What David was saying is, I don't fight the way you fight. Remember I said to you earlier, he said, sanctify them or separate them. If you don't separate yourself in the presence of the Lord, you are going to look at other people and you're going to fight the way they fight. And you're not going to allow God to train you in your authentic fighting style. I think that statement was better than the response I got. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. You have to look at what other people do. You have to respect what other people do, but you have to do it your own authentic way. Authenticity is an extremely important thing. And one of the greatest ways to find your authenticity is in the presence of God. When it's you and God alone, the way David did it. So then what happened is you is get this. The people started to praise David. They went into battle. David killed 10,000 people. Saul killed 1,000 people. And the women, get this, the women started to make up songs. You know, <laughs> this, is David, this is why David is one of my favorites. Not because he killed Goliath, but because women made songs about him. Like, oh, you're the best. <laughs> so the song went something like this. Like, these are the lyrics. I don't know the melody. The, the lyrics went something like, David killed his 10,000s. Saul killed his 1,000. And, um, and Saul got very angry. Saul got very, very angry because of this. And he wanted to kill David with a spear. 
He pinned David to the wall twice. The Bible says he pinned David to the wall twice and he escaped his presence twice. Now, this is how I know this is this is what David now did. He fled. He didn't fight. He fled. But he didn't flee because he couldn't fight Saul. Don't tell me you have the strength to kill Goliath, but you don't have to, but you don't have the strength to kill Saul. He had the strength to kill Saul, but he decided not to. He decided twice to flee from the situation. So he knew he had to fight Goliath because that is what God wanted him to do. He knew he had to flee from Saul because he knew that's what God wanted him to do. And then what happened is he went to a cave while Saul, now Saul was his father-in-law. For those of you who don't know it, uh, David married a woman called Michal and Michal's dad was Saul. So Saul was David's father-in-law. But some of you might say, but didn't David marry Bathsheba? David married four people. And at that time they had four wives. I think that's like very, very difficult. <sighs> right? I'm not married yet, but I'm so glad that I only get to have one. <laughs> Kiali Bua Jesu. <laughs> Imagine four. Imagine you married and there's like three others. But anyway, that's not important now. So his father-in-law chases him down with an army to kill him. So David starts to hide. And by the way, that's where a lot of the Psalms were written. A lot of the Psalms that David wrote, he was writing in hiding while his father-in-law Saul wanted to kill him. And um, so eventually the Philistines was overpowering Israel. The Israelites started to blame Saul. Saul got angry again and Saul committed suicide. That's how, that's how Saul died. He, com he committed suicide. And then um, Jonathan, his, his son, died with him in battle. And then the Israelites said they wanted David as king. And there David became king of Israel. This, this was years after he's been anointed as king. He became king years after he was anointed as king. So listen what thriving is. In, in, in order to understand what thriving is, we have to understand the will of God. Now, God has different kinds of wills. I don't, I, maybe I'll do a session on the wills of God if you guys want me to. You know, you get the decreed will, you get the permissive will, you get the perceived will. Today, I want to speak about one called the sovereign will. The sovereign will of God says, God has supreme and unrestricted power. The reason and final ground for all that exists and all that takes place is in God. He causes it to happen and He causes it to come to pass. God's sovereign will is where you give everything over to God. And you say, God, if you want something for me, I want it for myself. And this is why God chose David to be king. Because David wanted for himself what God wanted for him. Saul had what we call selfish ambition or striving. David had what we call godly ambition or thriving. Why was David thriving? Because David said, God, if you want something for me, I want it for myself. If you don't want something for me, I don't want it for myself. I'm not going to live in survival. I'm not going to live in striving, but I'm going to thrive the way God wants me to thrive. I'm going to go through the doors God opens for me. And if you want to thrive, you want to come to a place like David where you separate yourself, you sanctify yourself. You only want to do what God has anointed you to do. You want to do it when God has anointed you to do it, for when God has anointed you to do it. And here's why David was such a great king. He didn't care whether he was a king or a shepherd. He just wanted to do what God told him to do. Now imagine again he was in striving when Saul came against him. He would have been like, listen dude, I just killed a, I just killed a giant. I'm going to kill you too. That's what a striving person would have done. Revenge. My will, my way, my title. And Saul didn't do it. Ugh. David didn't do it because he wanted it to do it God's way. I'm going to finish this session with two scriptures. The Bible says in Isaiah 26 verse 3, You will keep him in perfect peace 
whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That word, that word mind comes down to the word imagination. How many of us, because our minds and our imaginations doesn't trust God, we are living in survival mode because that thing that we're protecting ourselves from literally lives on the inside of us. Don't let that thing live on the inside of you anymore. Start to trust. Don't strive. Start to trust. Who of you loves making clothes or making things? What do you call bray in English? Knitting. knitting. Do, you guys, do you guys like knitting? One person likes knitting. I don't know what this means. Some people go like this. Some people go like this. I don't know what this means. <laughs> okay. So, when you knit something, imagine you use different strings. Is that what you call it? Wool. 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 Like, I'm not a knitter. <laughs> Near. Um, so, you use different kinds of wool, different colors, and you knit things together. Imagine like to, to get one thing. Now listen to what the Bible says in Romans 8, 28 in the Passion Translation. We are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. For we are His lovers who have been called to fulfill His design purpose. Every detail of our lives is woven together for the good. The good, the bad, the big, the small, the significant, the insignificant. God takes all of these things and he's busy waving them. Is that the right word? Weaving. Weaving. Weaving them together for the good. And that's what he did to David. He took David's rejection from his father. He took David's, you know, when, when they saw David as a shepherd boy. And you know what I see in the story? What God has for you will be yours. Because seven people went before him and they didn't get it. Seven people. You can say seven people went for the interview before you. And they didn't get it. Seven people tried to start a business in that area and it didn't work. Seven people tried to date the girl before you and it didn't work. Why? Because what God has for you, what the sovereign God has for you, nobody else can take. This is why you don't have to strive. Because if it's meant for you, it's meant for you. This is, this is how God, this is why David didn't strive when, this, when Samuel came. This is my time. You know what? If God, if this is what God wants for me, seven can go before me, they won't get it. Because God has this for me. This is why we don't have to live in survival mode. We don't have to strive, but we can thrive. Because everything is woven together for our good. In Jesus' wonderful name. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for this day. We thank you for everybody listening. If you are listening today and you can say honestly, my life is not right with with God. I, I did not come to that place where I sanctified myself, where I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been living in religion, maybe you've been living in sin, but neither of, the, neither of the two can save you. It's only giving over to Jesus that can save you because you need a Savior. If this is you and you say, listen, I want to give my life to Jesus, just as an indication, either lift up your hand or just put your hand on your heart and say, that's me. I want to give my life back to Jesus. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I cannot save myself. I need a Savior. I'm calling out to you right now. Save me in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, I just pray for every single person that's, that's watching this and that have watched this, saying, listen, it feels like I'm in that survival mode. It feels like I'm in that striving mode. Survival is caused by stress. Striving is caused by fear. But I want to come in that peaceful mode where I trust God, where I can just trust like David did and thrive like David did. And that doesn't mean you do nothing, but it does mean you walk in obedience. You fight when God says fight. You flee when God says flee. You go when God says go. You, you stay when God says stay. I pray for that in Jesus' wonderful name. So I pray for every single person that says, listen, and this must be your greatest desire in prayer to say, Lord, help me to discern your will. Make your desires my desires. Make your will my will. Let me do what you want me to do. Let me not follow my own way. In Jesus' name. I just believe God is speaking to many people right now. And this is what I feel. Whatever God tells you to do, write it, write it down and do it. 
You know, at the wedding of Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine, Mary looked at the bartenders. I don't know if this is the right thing to say at a Christian service, but she looked at the bartenders, it's the truth. Um, and she said to them, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And this is what I want to tell you at the end of this session. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next week. May God bless you and goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.